You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast coming to you from Montecito, California. Today, before we begin, a reminder, there is a website called wealthformula.com that is associated with this particular program. And um, that's where you go to sign up for some of the things that are uh, related to this program, but that are not available necessarily by simply listening or watching to the podcast, including access to our credit investor group, which I highly suggest you join. One of the uh, things that is uh, uh, that we've talked about repeatedly now uh, is the uh, potential here for some opportunities, some distressed opportunities, you know, buying uh, potential distressed assets in a high uh, interest rate environment that already cash flow is a great uh, thing to do. Those types of opportunities are indeed coming up. They're coming through the door of the accredited investor group, but you got to be a member. You have to be onboarded and you have to uh, officially be an accredited investor. What is an accredited investor, you ask? Well, it's not something that you apply for. It's simply you are, you are not. Uh, If you make $200,000 per year for at least two years with a reasonable expectation of doing so in the future, or $300,000 if you are filing jointly, uh, you are an accredited investor. If you have a net worth of $1 million outside of your personal residence, you are an accredited investor. So, you either are one or you're not, kind of like you're pregnant or you're not pregnant. So you don't have to apply for anything. Although there are things I think you can do now, you can apply and, and, and get different ways of doing it. But bottom line is, if you are an accredited investor by the definitions that I just suggested, go ahead to wellformula.com and sign up for the accredited investor club and get onboarded sooner rather than later. Otherwise, you're going to miss out. So uh, let's talk a little bit about today uh, something that I think is uh, important. It's this concept of like, you know, income versus wealth and, you know, you know how to think about it. When I talk about the, the wealth formula, you know, I always kind of refer back to this mathematical formula, you know, and it, it, it's like wealth equals the um, uh, mass times velocity times leverage, right? Like, you know, for you physics geeks out there, they're, uh, I'm basically ripping off uh, some a little Newtonian physics, right? It, so it's a little, it's a little physics kind of uh, joke. So if you like physics jokes, you'll get it. But wealth equals ultimately leverage times mass times velocity. And in this equation, velocity is your rate of return and leverage is debt. So mortgages, obviously anything that can potentially amplify return is leverage. And mass is simply the amount of money that you actually invest. Now, mass is critically important. Duh. After all, if you don't invest any of your money, it doesn't matter how good the other variables are. It doesn't matter how your uh, how good your rate you know your your rate of return is. It doesn't matter you know the the amount of leverage you use. It just doesn't matter because it's gonna not gonna move the dial if you don't invest. Now, luckily. Most people in uh, this community have a decent amount of mass. It's a community made up of a lot of high-paid professionals, a lot of physicians. Uh, um, you got dentists, lawyers, uh, small business owners. Income is typically not our main pain point. It's the other variables that you know that can potentially help turn that income into wealth that provide us uh, with our. Uh, uh, biggest challenges, right? So now I tend to think of the various businesses that I have as, as fuel, you know, that ignites my investments that then turn into wealth. So the more fuel I've got, uh, which is of course, the more cash I've got, right? The more income I've got, the more ability I have to grow my wealth. It's like the metaphor there that I think of literally in my head is me shoveling cash from my businesses into a bunch of real estate to keep the wealth churning. And that's literally how I think about it. Okay. Now you may be quite happy with the amount of money you are able to put into your investments. And, and, um, and, and if you are, that's great, you know, uh, not a problem, but if you're not one option is to consider, uh, is to consider to either start or, you know, potentially buy another business. And the reason why is that, when you put, I don't really put businesses, maybe I should, but in my head, I don't really think of, you know, the purpose of my businesses as much as an investment as I think of them as income, uh, uh, driving income, right? 
And so there's no doubt that businesses require more work. And so it's hard for me to consider it just purely a cash investment. Anyone who tells you otherwise that, you know, that you can just buy a business and, you know, unless you're buying stock in a company or something like that, uh, anyone who tells you that it's not work is just lying. However, it's also the reason they tend to cash flow m more. You know, there are a lot of uh, variables of businesses that make them inherently riskier uh, than, a, than a piece of brick and mortar that people live in or something like that. And because, and because there's more risk, there is more reward, right? So that's the way you think about it. So maybe if you are concerned that, ah, uh, hey, I don't have, you know, I'm not really you know, getting to where I want with my wealth goals, it's, you know, rather than focusing purely on the, uh, you know, the investment side of it itself, you might need to be thinking, I might need more income, and therefore I may need to consider uh, different avenues of increasing income, including uh, potentially getting involved with the acquisition or starting a business. You know, I am a, personally, I'm a, I'm a, a guy who starts businesses, right? That's what I do. Um, and I'm, I've been fairly comfortable with that and I've done well with it. I've struck out on some and I've hit, hit on some and that's just the way entrepreneurship is. It, it can be risky. It might be a risk worth taking for some of you, especially if you're, you know, if you're just not happy where you're at in your life with your income status and your ability to grow your wealth. And if you're, you know, if you're not a startup type guy like I am, uh, or maybe, you know, you just prefer a little bit more structure and you know that you could be a good student, uh, franchising just might be uh, worth looking into uh, because it's effectively just taking what other people, you know, have, have put into a, a book, studying it and executing it, right? It's like being a good student. So a lot of you might actually... Um, uh, might actually work for you. So anyway, this week on Wealth Formula Podcast, we're going to revisit the concept of franchises with Kim Daly. She's been on the show a bunch of times. She's always a, a bundle of energy to talk to. And uh, I don't know, check it out for yourself. Uh, see if it's uh, worth something to consider, but it's always uh, always something to uh, good to know about. And we will have that uh, interview with Kim right after these messages. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, my guest, she's been on a couple times already. Uh, three Pete, I guess, is what she has described herself as. Uh, name is Kim Daly. She is uh, the Daily Coach. She is involved in the world of franchising, and also, I would say, um, I guess, uh, probably sort of a, just coaching in general, right? Business coaching, life coaching, um, all those types of things. So, welcome back, Kim. How are you? I am great, Buck. I am so happy to be here. Yeah, that's good. That's good to hear. First of all, um, just wanted to find out a little bit about what's going on with you. You've been on the show, you know, a few times. We've talked about uh, franchises and that kind of thing. Uh, what's new in the world of franchises, especially in the, you know, in, in the situation that we're in in the world right now, where it seems like there's so much uh, instability and people don't want to make decisions. Right? Fuck, you said it. Yeah. Okay, look, here's the best thing about franchising. In mm -hmm. good times and in bad, the franchise industry grows. Uh -huh. So what people invest in changes, right? Because their mindset is different, right? If they're looking for the American dream, money is money is flowing, right? The They're looking to create wealth. They're investing in certain types of businesses there, but in an unstable environment when they're losing jobs or they fear that instability in their job, they turn to franchising for control. Right. And they may think about different types of businesses, but in either case, franchising wins. So when people come to me, Buck, the whole thing is I'm going to meet you right where you're at. Right. Is your glass half empty? Is your glass half full? Are yeah. you looking at, you know, the next three to five years and in that kind of like survival mentality? Or are you really looking to build wealth? Because wherever you're at, I can coach your mindset and then lead you to opportunities that match that. I mean, ultimately, the whole reason you want to invest in a franchise is to mitigate the risks of owning mm -hmm. a business because mm -hmm. you're in this with other people. <laughs> You know, I think you mentioned, uh, you use the words um, invest in a franchise. I think one of the things that's important to distinguish, and I think one of the things that people are afraid of is there's one thing to invest in a franchise. It's another to own a job. And so how do you, um, I mean, if you're if you're getting into this and you're like, you know what, I'm, I'm interested, I want to get 
get some exposure to something outside of say your um, you know your typical your typical alternatives and your typical you know equities and all that kind of thing and, and have some business exposure how realistic is it to do something where it's really not gonna uh, just create another huge time suck for you and 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 just you know buy in, buying another job yeah 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 so totally great question well a franchise business will never be passive. It's not going to be like the land I just yeah. invested in last year, right? Or like my oil and gas investment, which pays me dividends. Totally passive for Kim Daly. The business needs you as the owner to be the leader. Now, whether you're a leader that can lead with five to 10 hours a week in the right environment with the right structure provided by the franchisor, then maybe you could have that in business and be successful. Um, but in that very same business, another owner may need to put in 30 to 40 hours a week because everybody's leadership skill, everybody's ability to invest their money and then leave it alone, right, is going to be is going to vary and be different. Everybody's learning curve is different. So we're very careful in franchising. We use the word semi absentee. Uh -huh. So this typically means 20 to 25 hours a week in the beginning. And then as you get the right general manager and leadership team in place, then you could step back maybe to 10 to 15 hours. Now I've worked with many Buck Joffrey followers. I've been blessed. Uh, you know, your cardiologists, your dentists, they're mm -hmm. all over the country opening franchise businesses. And the fun part is that a lot of them are actually in similar businesses that are very hands-free. Think like a laundromat. When I say that, I don't want to be misleading in any way. Yeah, yeah, sure. Right, but a laundromat, you're leveraged through washers and dryers, not your time, compared to if you were buying like a senior care business, which basically is specialized staffing, right, where you have all these caregivers to manage, yeah. and that's a very full-time business. So here you're leveraged through people. In the laundromat, you're leveraged through equipment. So you buy back your time with that investment in the laundromat, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So it, again, it depends where you're starting from. But to answer the question you asked, if you're looking for an investment because you want to be hands-on in the business, we have lots of those options. But if you're an extremely busy W-2 employee, but you're looking to build another cash flowing asset so you could step back from being a doctor or step back from being a dentist over time, there certainly are franchise options that I can lead you to that will help you bridge the gap until you have enough cash flow from the new investment to be able to comfortably step back. You know, one of the things that people are probably trying to understand and I know you, it, it's going to vary very much, but it's, as a general rule, the return profile of something uh, on a franchise is going to be very different than from a business because, you know, I, I always tell people, listen, it's, it's funny because sometimes you get people in the real estate space who come in and on podcasts and they talk about these returns and they may be 30, 40% returns and, and it blows people's minds. They're like, that's fantastic. But the thing is, it's a completely different animal, right? The risk profile is different. Uh, the work amount is different. It's no, you can't look at it the same way that you look at a piece of real estate um, or, you know, just some asset that you're just going to wait and, and, and collect dividends from. So when people say, Hey, you know, Kim, okay, realistically, you know, I'm, I'm a high paid uh, professional right now. I mean, what kind of returns, you know, uh, could I potentially be looking at? Like, you know, like as a percentage of investment, Like, do, do you have a range at least? Or can you give me some comment on whether or not uh, or, or, or as a starting point, you know, to say whether this might not even be worth it for me to even think about? Look, Buck. I wish I could, but it's yeah. totally illegal, right? So yeah, franchising okay. Franchising is regulated by the Federal Trade Commission. Mm -hmm. And while franchisors can make earnings claims, and they do in their franchise disclosure documents, Kim Daly cannot. Now, that doesn't mean that I can't teach you. Like, the answer to the question that you're asking has to be massaged a little bit. And here's how I'm going to answer it. So when you think about the return on investment, there's many factors that go into the return on investment in a franchise. Because people in a business are not typically transactional like you are when you invest in other things right. that are passive. The business provides some, like, 
sense of pride. Oftentimes it's a legacy builder for children. Maybe you get your children involved or you're gonna leave it to your children. So there's intangibles in this, okay? So you have your EBITDA, right? Your net mm -hmm. return to you. But here's the thing we also can't downplay. And I'm gonna pick on Planet Fitness. So let's say that you were to go out and say, Kim, you know what? Forget about franchising and all the fees. I'm gonna go start my own gym. Mm -hmm. Cool. And you're going to build this gym to sell it because you're smart enough to know in the gym business, this isn't a long-term thing, right? I'm going to do it for five to seven years and I'm going to flip it. So you're out there under Bucks boot camp. <laughs> that mm -hmm. That's good. Sure, sure. <laughs> right? Okay. Now in the same five to seven years, I, knowing what I know about franchising, invest in a little brand that's up and coming called Planet Fitness. So let's say during that five to seven years, Planet Fitness is growing all over the country. And as I'm sitting here in my hometown in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is where Planet Fitness started, um, my equity, the brand equity is growing because as people wake up all over the country, they're starting to go, what is this $10 a month fitness club? What do you get for $10 a month? So you see where I'm going with this? So I have friends in Planet Fitness that cashed out for eight times sure. their EBITDA of every location they owned. Very close friends, 58 years old, was paid $80 million to sell his Planet Fitness clubs, 10 of them. Yeah. So the, the return is not just what you're getting in your net, but this is the importance of partnering yourself with people who have a vision yeah. for building a national brand. If the brand equity has no value, you might not be, you might just be better off to go do your own thing. But if you're partnered with the right people who are really building a national brand, then on top of the multiple you would normally apply in that industry to that business when you go to sell it, now that multiple could be multiplied because of that brand equity. So there's many factors. Yeah, no, and I, I, I get that. There's the whole multiple and selling the business thing. And, and there's, there's definitely that, I think. But I think to the point that I was trying to bring is that I think a lot of people um, in my group um, who you've talked to, um, I think really will, they love the, the generous. Listen, who doesn't want to get an eight or nine or 10 times multiple on earnings? Of course you do. But, you know, what you're talking about is a, a situation that is, you know, to a certain degree that you get lucky in that situation too, right? I mean, you you are there's a little speculative aspect to that. It's not like you're not going to predict the next ten x uh, every time, but I think a lot of people come into this actually more with the cash flow in mind, right? They're like thinking, I'm okay, great if I get the back end, if I get an eight to ten x, but really what you know, what kind of income am I going to get? Because that's what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to replace my income. And fantastic if I become a gazillionaire because the thing blows up and I'm planet, you know, fitness or whatever the heck I am, then that's great. But in the meantime, I'm just, I want, I want to make some money so I can work less. So what do you say to that? If you go to business school, right, they're going to teach you that, you know, a reasonable expectation in the business. This is not mm -hmm. an earnings claim. Do not sue me. This is my disclaimer, yeah, yeah. right? you know, somewhere between between 10 and 20%, right, of your gross. But there are certainly franchises that are higher than that, and there are franchises that are lower. Even within the same business, let's say a franchisor shows you that on a million dollars top line out of like one location or one servicing territory, mm -hmm. right? Let's pick a non brick and mortar business that's running trucks through a territory like in a sure. home service. And you get this thing to a million bucks and let's say, cause sometimes the margins in that can be higher. Um, so let's say that you're able to pull out a 30% net on that. So you're taking home 300. Sure. But so in the beginning, you're like, all right, if the average franchisee gets to a million, there's no cap, especially in a non brick and mortar business, right? So that's average. Is anybody starting out to be average? So that's where it comes back to ownership, yeah. right? And yeah. then, you know, m using the systems and tools, because what if you could get that to 3 million or yeah. what if you could get it to 5 million or what if you're like, all right, if an average tour territory grosses a, a million nets me 300, but I want to own three of them. So I'm building toward about a million dollar EBITDA spread out over three territories. Sure. So we're going to look at that as we go through our one to two month due diligence process, you're going to be working with the franchisors validating out in the real world with their existing franchise owners who all got in for a good return as well, right. figure out for yourself 
what you believe you can do with the model and the time frame that it will take you. But the most important part, if you're a listener on this show, if your time is limited, you know, you really need someone like me because not every franchisor allows you to come in with a limited time perspective. You know, that's where you, you have to have someone like me that has 22 years of relationships because I know which franchisors really allow it and then will validate to that where the average owner in their system looks like you and sounds like you is a busy W sure. looking for a bridge. Um, and it's not just going to be like, yeah, they told me I could be semi absent, but at the end of the day, this was not semi absentee. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly, um, uh, an option and, and maybe you could talk to, I mean, you've talked to a certain degree about, you know, the, the possibility of getting a, a better multiple because, you, you know, you've partnered with uh, a brand, which is a, certainly a, um, an upside of a potential franchise. Um, but what, what other advantages would you have uh, compared to just, you know, going out and buying yourself a, a business from, you know, a business broker? Okay. So the biggest difference for your listeners, at least that I can tell from your average listener is that mm -hmm. they don't want to be full time in the business. So yeah. if you're going to go buy a private business for sale where all that learning curve is on you, right? And there maybe aren't any systems there, 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 the technology is not there. It's just not an efficiently run business. I mean, that's going to be a needle in a haystack that you have to find through a business broker and then probably pay, pay some like huge multiple for that. But here in a franchise, you could come in without any track record in your area, right? So you're not like cleaning up a mess that another owner created in terms of customer reviews and things like that. You get to build this from the ground up, but you're not starting something from scratch. It's proven, right? Yeah. It's a franchise. It's been proven somewhere else. It's just new to your area. So you get to build that relationship with the customer and tell them who you are and what your value proposition is. So that's the, the greatest advantage is that the franchise is going to come with all of those ready-made systems and tools that helps you buy down that learn curve so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel and or be there to learn it all. If you're venturing into a semi-absentee business, the franchisor probably wants you to go to training with your general manager. They're mm -hmm. probably more interested in getting to know your general manager than you because that's the person that they'll be dealing with on an ongoing basis, right? Yeah, and th that's so, a good point too, thing. is that like in a lot of these situations, like, um, you know, you you if you yourself are not going to be involved, you, you probably are going to need to have at least one, you know, key not to say that you won't be involved, but if you're not going to be yes. on the ground, you're going to need to hire, you know, sort of your yes. chief operating officer, that employee number one, who really is going to drive the whole thing so that, you know, and, and I guess in, in that regard, maybe there's an opportunity for partnerships with people and things like that too, right? So you can give them upside. You know, what's really fun in the, in the med spa space for your audience is oftentimes we need um, a doctor on the payroll. And so if you are that doctor, right, and you have a network of like nurse practitioners or people that you know that would be your employee number one, it just helps alleviate those worries of I have to really rely on this person. How am I going to find this person? Now, Every single person that invests in a semi-absentee business where they have to rely on the general manager kind of trips into that pothole. Right. <laughs> but if you stay with the process, you'll realize every other franchisee out there tripped in the pothole too. So there's no reason to trip in the pothole. If the franchisor says, hey, we're going to help you find the general mm -hmm. manager, then we have to trust that they're going to help us find that general manager or they have, you know, tools like zip recruiter or things like that with the right ad to run to help you attract the right person. And then you'll be able to validate with other owners in the system to find out how are they incentivizing that general manager so that when you're not there, you know that your business is taken care of. But again, going back to your original question of the benefits. So if you have all this back end technology and let's say that you have a membership business, so it's not even a cash business, which is why I don't like showing food, right? So there's really no tr cash transactions and everything is in back in this intranet. You could be at your office, you know, working your nine to five and totally plugged into the receivables for the day. Like, you know, with cameras you could see in your store. I mean, this is modern day business at its best and franchising offers you that.
realistically, when you think, uh, say you're thinking about, well, maybe this is something I ought to talk to Kim about, um, what what kinds of numbers should you have in mind in terms of initial capital to, to, to actually uh, invest? That's a great question. So money and time are inversely related in this equation, Buck. Mm -hmm. So when you see these lower investments going in, those are typically owners that have to be there full time. So like, and think like a real estate agent, you know, oh, I work from home. Well, you're not leveraged through anything. You are the business. So that's gonna be a very full time effort by the owner. But when we flip that back to my laundromat example, right, where you're leveraged through the location and then the washers and the dryers, it comes with a very minimal time commitment by the owner, maybe five hours a week in that particular example. Mm -hmm. But again, you'd have to do your own due diligence. I don't wanna be making any claims about time commitment, but you see how you're like, okay, like common sense would imply, right? There's not really much to do. I'm not there folding people's laundry, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I hope you're not. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. That's more of an investor model. But there are other models. Maybe you've heard of like the big blue swim school, right? Sure. This business exploded during COVID. All these hotel people that were losing money in the hotel business because nobody was traveling put their money into this new swim school idea that was brought to, to life by an Olympic swimmer and his dad, who was part of a private equity team in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And they blew this thing up. And, you know, that business model is an investor's model. It's designed for you to have a six figure general manager running the pool. Yeah. And then that person's hiring all of the um, swim instructors, you know, for f and pool maintenance and all of that. So but that's, you know, probably a two to a three million dollar investment. Mm -hmm. right? Awesome returns, but you're heavily leveraged. So your time commitment would be small. And there's millions of shades of gray in between, yeah. which is, again, where our conversation begins. Because oftentimes people have a spouse, right? Or maybe you do have like a partner you have in other investments that has more time than you have to put into the business. You know, so this is where we massage that conversation. And I don't talk you into anything. I just talk you through it. Yeah. To help challenge your thought and help you see like, oh, okay, this is how it could work. These are the types of businesses I should be focused on to help me drive those types of outcomes. Right. Well, you know, it, it it's uh, it's certainly, I think, worth a conversation um, for a lot of people out there who are thinking about, you know, trying to, um, you know, try try to try something different and, you know, shake things up a little bit. You have a podcast as well, right? It's called Create Wealth Through Franchising on uh -huh. all the typical platforms. And then I have a massive YouTube channel with over 900 videos. You can find me at Kim Daily. Dot TV. My last name is D-A-L-Y. One, one thing I haven't said today, Buck, is that my services for your for for people are totally free. Yeah. Yeah, I don't charge you for what I do. I don't work for free. I'm paid like a recruiter by the franchisors right. to help them grow their business, right? By me doing all this sort of upfront work and the matching process, financially, territory, like yep. where you want the business to be, making sure that your expectations are in line with their expectations. Well, by the time I put you on their desk, you're just that much more qualified. And so they can have much higher level conversations. That's why they pay Kim Daly to do this awesome, to do this awesome matchmaking. Fantastic. And if they, if people want to talk to you about that, how do they get a hold of you? Yeah, please go to the daily coach.com D A L Y the daily coach.com. I have a free 20 minute webinar that will just kind of, it's like a little boot camp. What is a franchise? What am I actually doing? You know, there are so many options beyond food and retail. Like I, you would have to beg me to show you food. Yeah. Um, there is so much money to be made in all kinds of services, whether it is swimming lessons or home services or, you know, products and services for the elderly. I mean, there's just endless options, anti-aging, beauty, pets, pets are huge and never going anywhere yeah. right we spent yeah. a lot of money on our pets so like businesses that go way beyond what people typically think they get stuck at the pothole is jersey mike's and chick-fil-a and i don't want to own one of those right. franchising isn't for me no 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 yeah. come to kim daily i even have all kinds of videos dispelling that myth right at my youtube channel at kim daily tv fantastic kim thanks for being on as usual and uh, i'm sure i'm sure we'll have you on in another few months and make it number four 
It would be awesome. Thank you, Buck. I love your audience. I appreciate the opportunity to share. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. And of course, uh, Kim's always fun to have on the show. She's uh, lots of energy. Um, I do want to uh, remind you uh, one more time because uh, we do have uh, potential offerings coming up. If you are interested in potentially some fairly significantly distressed assets uh, and opportunities in deploying capital and you are an accredited investor, go to wealthformula.com and sign up for your accredited investor club now. Get onboarded and uh and get ready um there's lots of opportunities again we are in an unusual situation where rates again are interest rates are high we know they are going to go down um so that if you can find a distressed asset now uh that is cash flowing at these particular interest rates and you are going into a descending um descending insurance rate environment that means asset prices go up it's a great place to be um obviously there's no uh, guarantees in anything, but certainly this is a, a, a great potential buying opportunity, uh, this environment. And as you know, we have some assets that may really be appealing to you. So go check that out. Go to wealthformula.com, sign up for Investor Club, get on board. And that's it for me this week on Wealth Formula Podcast. This is Buck Joffrey signing off. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.